Well, good evening and welcome to MacArthur Baptist Church. We're going through uh, this Wednesday uh, with part two of discovering our spiritual gifts. So uh, we're looking forward to being able to cover various different spiritual gifts to see uh, if we can help you to discern uh, what spiritual gift God has given to you so that uh, you're able to use it uh, for the work of the ministry and for the glory of God. So let's uh, begin, shall we? Okay, we're going to first of all start with the distinction of spiritual gifts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations. It is the same God which worketh all in all. So we see there in that uh, passage of scripture that there are a number of different uh, types of gifts. Uh, they're diverse from one another. They're different from one another. Uh, they have different functions. And, uh, and so uh, we want to be able to uh, find out uh, which of those different uh, spiritual gifts uh, belongs to ourselves, okay, because uh, we'll have different gifts in the church. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, tells us, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one, uh, sorry, the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And with that verse of scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us to understand uh, this uh, very interesting and yet very controversial subject. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise and thanks and yes, Lord, we acknowledge uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one uh, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Lord, we give you praise uh, for all the wonderful advantages and privileges, Lord, that you give to us in life. And uh, Lord, uh, we're thankful that uh, you equip us and enable us. We saw, Lord, in previous studies of how you have uh, put within us the law of God and uh, but within our hearts and that uh, there is that divine uh, grace uh, at work in our lives. And not only, Lord, do you give us the desire to do right, uh, but Lord, you equip us to be able to serve one another. And so, Lord, we ask, Father, give us uh, discernment and help us to uh, have understanding, Lord, as we look at this subject of spiritual gifts uh, and Lord, in particular, so that uh, we might uh, make a practical uh, dis discovery of our own spiritual gift that we might serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, these verses that we've just read tell us firstly that there is a gift that God gives to us. So you and I have at least one spiritual gift uh, that God wants us to use, okay? And whether we have more than one or not uh, is up to debate, but um, there is at least one. And so it says, as every man hath received the gift. It's not just referring to the gift of God, which is eternal life, but it's referring in the context to the spiritual gift that God has given to each and every one of us. And that gift will vary depending on uh, the different uh, people that God has given the gifts to. Secondly, we see that the purpose of re receiving this gift is, first of all, to minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So as stewards, stewards manage that which is not their own, but has been given to them uh, for the purpose of uh, the owner, uh, and of course the owner here is God, and God has uh, given us uh, spiritual gifts to minister the same one to another, and one day we will give account of how we have used our spiritual gift. 
another purpose we see there is that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So uh, one of the purposes of spiritual gifts is to glorify God through their use. And that's why it's important that we uh, discern uh, what uh, spiritual gifts we have. Thirdly, there are basically two types of gifts, which are speaking and serving gifts. The Bible says there, if any man speak, let him speak as of the as the oracles of God. Uh, in other words, uh, that uh, we ought to speak as authoritative, uh, because uh, what we're uh, speaking uh, is from the Word of God, which are known as the oracles of God. And then it says, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. So God is able to give us strength even when we're weak. He's able to give us strength to be able to serve one another. And there are three main Bible passages that list the various gifts that can be grouped into these two groups of speaking and serving gifts. Uh, and they are 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, and then Romans 12 and then Ephesians 4. So as we look at a division of uh, the speaking gifts versus the serving gifts, uh, first of all, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that uh, under the speaking gifts, there's the word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Uh, and then under the serving gifts, we find faith, healing, and miracles. And a little further down in the passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through to 30, we find further gifts uh, which are mentioned, which is under the speaking gifts, uh, apostle, and then uh, teaching, and then under the serving gifts, helps and governments. And if we turn, if we turn to uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, we find there's seven gifts there, four which are speaking gifts, Prophecy, teaching, exhortation or encouragement, and mercy, uh, and then serving gifts, which are ministry or serving, giving, and ruling or organizing. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we have speaking gifts, and basically these gifts, as we mentioned last week, are more uh, office gifts, they're gifts not so much to the individual as they are gifts to the church, uh, but these involve uh, speaking as well as some degree of serving as well. So apostles, prophecy, evangelist, and pastor teacher. Uh, so pastor teacher, not two different gifts, but uh, the one uh, gift which is given uh, to the church. Now, let's have a look at this cartoon and ask ourselves how this applies to spiritual gifts. Here are a number of animals that uh, lined up there uh, and uh, we have someone who say, okay, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Well, obviously, though those various different animals are uh, fit and healthy, uh, they're not all equipped to be climbing trees. Uh, the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 12, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, or ministry, uh, or he that teacheth, or he that exhorteth, he that giveth, he that ruleth, he that showeth mercy. So there's a, uh, the uh, different types of uh, gifts that are mentioned there in Romans chapter 12. And of course, um, they don't all give the same abilities to be able to do certain things. And so uh, I've named each of those animals there by the name of one of those uh, uh, giftings. Uh, the bird there is the prophet, the monkey is the servant, the penguin is the teacher, the elephant's the exhorter, the fish is the giver, the seal is the organizer and the, uh, the dog is the mercy. Now, this cartoon portrays what often happens in church. 
We've each been given a gift, but our gifts differ. It shouldn't distress us that someone may do another thing better than we do because we are given different measures of gift. So we may be given, you may find someone who has the same spiritual gift as you, but maybe they, they have a far more advanced um, ability than you do. That's okay, they've just been given a different measure. They're accountable for their measure of gift as well as the use of the gift. Um, and uh, if you don't have a, a great measure uh, of ability for that particular gift, that's okay because you'll only be judged on the basis of the measure that you have. So if God made you a fish saint, then swim to your heart's content. And don't worry that you can't climb a tree like the monkey saints. And if you're an eagle saint, stop expecting penguin saints to fly like you do. They may be a bird, but they certainly are not uh, very good at flying through the air. Maybe flying through the water, uh, certainly they can do that, but not flying through the air. So diversity of gifts makes the body effective. The Bible says again in Romans 12, verses 3 to 4, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So a church, a church has a number of people that are all different one from another, and God has given us gifts, everyone, which are very diverse from one another. And even where one may have a, the same gift as another, uh, there is a, a different measure of faith that is given to each uh, individual. Now, we want to look at, uh, secondly, the duration of spiritual gifts. And what we'll find is that uh, not all spiritual gifts uh, have lasted down through the ages. Uh, and uh, so we're going to look at, at this particular subject. To understand the availability of gifts to us today, we have to understand that the early church was in a time of transition before the Bible was completed in written form. Uh, in some ways, uh, the uh, failure to understand the time of transition, uh, especially during the, the time of the book of Acts, uh, has led people to having various different uh, ideas about the ministry of the Holy Spirit um, because uh, they uh, look at uh, what is written there in the book of Acts and fail to understand that it's a time of transition and so they think that that's normative for today when that's not necessarily the case. We, we know that it was a time of transition because things happened over time in the infant church that happen immediately today. Uh, to give you an example, in the beginning of the church period, believers had to wait for the reception of the Holy Spirit, often at the hands of an apostle. Whereas today, the very moment someone becomes a believer, they receive the Holy Spirit without the laying on of hands. So in the early church, in the book of Acts chapter 8, we read, uh, it says there in verses 14 to 17, Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, that is, they'd responded to the preaching of the gospel by Philip, uh, it says that they sent unto them Peter and John, two apostles, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, prayed for the believers, the new converts, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet, and notice this, this is in brackets, so it shows that uh, the, he's trying to help the reader to understand. For as yet, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So that was what took place during the transitional time 
uh, of the early church. But today it, we find that it's different. We find if we look in the epistles uh, where the doctrine is uh, firmly, uh, uh, firmly uh, laid out for us, it says in Ephesians 1, uh, speaking of us who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So it's, it mentions there that once we hear uh, and, and respond, once we hear the word of truth, which is the gospel of salvation, uh, and then we believe in response to the hearing of the gospel, then uh, it's saying there that after you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, the Spirit of God uh, comes in to live uh, in your body as a temple of the Holy Ghost. So uh, we see there, when it says after that you believe, it doesn't mean a long time after. It, it means uh, at the very moment uh, when uh, you believe, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's when we are raptured, when we have our bodies transformed and made new at the resurrection. And so we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us as a guarantee that one day uh, we will be totally redeemed from uh, this world. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if that's not good enough, Romans chapter 8, verse 9b says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, and the idea is having, have not the Spirit of Christ dwelling in him, he is none of his. So um, uh, obviously today uh, when we get saved, uh, the Spirit of God comes into us straight away and uh, we belong to him. Now, because the early church was in a time of transition, some of the gifts were given to compensate the fact that the New Testament wasn't finished being written and wasn't yet available to the churches at the time of the early church. So, so that the churches had the benefit of New Testament doctrine, certain gifts operated for a temporary time that were designed to reveal New Testament truth to the early believers in the absence of the written New Testament. Paul implies this when writing to the church at Corinth. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, in other words, when I became mature, when I became complete, I put away childish things. So here we have a picture of a little baby and uh, it's quite normal that he would be playing with those uh, rings. I remember when I was a kid, when I was little, that uh, I used to play with those as well and enjoy putting them in the right order and uh, putting them uh, over the, uh, the pole there. Uh, but uh, it's a bit strange when we see something like this, where there's an adult man and uh, he's playing uh, with the same sorts of toys and not doing so just to impress someone or make a, a joke, but he's actually uh, playing with them as, as if that's a normal thing in his life. There's something that's not quite mature uh, about someone like that. So speaking as a child uh, suggests an incomplete or a partial vocabulary or knowledge. Uh, I like this little cartoon here where uh, a dad is holding his baby and he says, I've recorded every noise my baby makes so that when he's older, I can play it back and he can tell me what he was trying to say. Well, of course, uh, <laughs> the other fellow looks quite shocked uh, because uh, the little baby won't be able to uh, tell him or even when he gets older, he won't be able to tell him uh, what he was trying to say because a lot of what he was saying was just experimenting with sound uh, and uh, had a very limited vocabulary. So uh, the, what Paul is saying suggests that some speaking gifts brought partial revelation. 
until the perfect or complete revelation came into being. The Bible says, but whoso looketh into the perfect, and the word perfect there means complete law of liberty, which is the Bible, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the Bible is like a mirror uh, where we see, uh, where we view the, uh, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the more we look, as it were, the more we become like the Lord Jesus, not, not physically, but in character. But we see there that uh, uh, the idea of looking into the perfect law of liberty uh, the law of liberty there is the word of God. So understanding and thinking as a child suggests that for a time there was only a partial knowledge and understanding of New Testament doctrine. And this is uh, reflected in Paul's words uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 uh, verses 8 to 10 where he said, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So remember that Paul here is speaking about knowledge revealed by revelational gifts. Uh, he mentions three gifts that will no longer be needed. He mentions prophecies, whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. He mentions tongues, whether they be tongues, they shall cease. And knowledge, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It's not talking about knowledge that you accumulate in the world or uh, from going to school or from researching on the internet or reading in books. This is talking about a supernatural revelational knowledge uh, that uh, was able to be given um, to, the, uh, to the church. So these verses are not referring to, of course, all spiritual gifts. Uh, when it says that uh, these things will cease or fail or vanish away, uh, it's only speaking about certain revelational gifts to tide the church over while it waited for the inspirational writing of the New Testament. Inspiration uh, in the sense that God breathed writing of the New Testament. Now, other evidences that some gifts were temporary, and of course temporary is something that we're hoping uh, the COVID virus thing will be temporary. We've probably seen this sign similar to it to help stop the spread of coronavirus. We've made some temporary changes and sometimes it seems like they're permanent changes, but uh, we can be assured that uh, they are temporary. We will get through this, uh, this virus thing uh, eventually. Now, uh, let's have a look at some gifts that were temporary, or in particular the, apost the apostolic gift. Uh, the apostolic gift was temporary and some spiritual gifts were unique to the apostles as well. Uh, so the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Notice there that uh, it, it speaks about the signs, not of a Christian, but the signs of an apostle. And notice that it says they were wrought among you, uh, past tense in that sense. Uh, and so uh, we see that there were certain things that uh, were characteristic of an apostle. Uh, they were patient uh, and they did signs and wonders or miracles in other words, and various different mighty deeds. An apostle was required to have been with Christ throughout his entire earthly ministry. Uh, if we go in our Bibles to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1 and verse uh, 21 through to verse uh, 25, I'll get there myself in a sec, uh, it says this. Now this, this is um, 
before Pentecost when the disciples were gathered together, 120 disciples, and uh, when they recognized that uh, Judas has, has killed himself and uh, they're thinking that we need a replacement apostle. So in verse 21 it says, Wherefore, uh, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one, one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. All right, so here we see that they're trying to pick out another apostle uh, to take the place of Judas. And they picked two men. Uh, I don't believe that either of those men uh, was God's choice for being an apostle. I'll explain that a little bit later. But we find uh, that uh, the idea of uh, being an apostle had to do uh, with um, uh, being with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout his entire earthly ministry and in particular being a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll see that again a bit later. But an exception to this, of course, is that the Apostle Paul, uh, he said he was an apostle born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Uh, some even challenged his claim uh, to be an apostle, he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 11, I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for nothing am I behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. So in other words, he's not bragging, but he is, he is telling them that he has all the credentials, the right credentials for being an apostle. The book of Revelation, however, establishes that there were only 12 apostles. For the new Jerusalem has a wall with 12 foundations. And in verse 14 of Revelation 21, it says, And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So there's just 12 apostles, and that doesn't include Judas. The 12th apostle, of course, is the apostle Paul. Also, Paul talks about the New Testament temple of God, being built on a foundation. Now, of course, by the temple of God, we're not talking about a building made of bricks. We're talking about uh, the people of God. And uh, it's a foundation, of course, only occurs at the beginning of a building. Uh, and so it says in Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Another qualification for the apostolic office was that they had to have seen the resurrected Christ with their own eyes. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, the apostle Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So we see that though the apostle Paul wasn't uh, around in, when the Lord Jesus was ministering on earth for the three and a half uh, years that uh, the other uh, disciples were with Jesus, uh, we do note that he did see the resurrected uh, Lord Jesus Christ and it had a very transforming um, effect on his life. So one of the main responsibilities of an apostle of Christ was to give eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the grave. So Acts chapter 2 verse 32 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. And he's there referring to the other disciples. And there's a few other references there in Acts. Acts chapter 3 and verse 15 says, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. 
then if we go over across to chapter 5 uh, verse 29 uh, it says this um, it says uh, and now Lord behold their threatenings I think this is right oh no sorry we've got the wrong uh, verse uh, it says then Peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hung on a, a tree or hanged on a tree him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him that is obeying the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ not um, obeying uh, as far as good works are concerned and then uh, if we skip over to chapter 10 uh, verse uh, 39 to 42 uh, we read there and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree him God raised up the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but unto witnesses chosen before of God even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose uh, from the dead and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead it's also significant that Paul says and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time you see Paul was the last one in the series of apostles to see the resurrected Christ and as a result the last one to be appointed an apostle of Christ so just as in the picture of the dominoes eventually you get to the last one Paul was the last one the last apostle sometimes you hear of people who uh, refer to themselves as apostle Jacobs or apostle Thomas or something like that uh, today it's become more of a recent uh, phenomena where people refer to themselves as an apostle but scripturally speaking they're not really apostles because they have not seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ thus when Paul and the other apostles died so did the gift of apostleship along with the special signs that went with apostleship they were temporary and not an example of what all Christians can expect to be able to do or even some Christians in every generation for example it says in Acts 19 11 and 12 and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul and it goes on to describe some of those miracles but the word special means extraordinary or uncommon or uh, not 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 in uh, not available or not in use by the average Christian these were apostolic apostolic uh, miracles that were taking place that went with the gift of apostleship and then in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 it says how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him so the ones that heard him were the disciples the apostles God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will uh, so it's interesting it doesn't say God also bearing us witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will he says God also bearing them the ones that heard him they're actually in his physical presence notice that even by the time the book of Hebrews was written that the signs wonders various miracles and certain gifts of the Holy Spirit were associated only with those who had heard Jesus in other words the Apostles a principle concerning what gifts are operational today is this the duration of a gifts availability depends on its purpose for existing 
One gift that is clearly linked to its purpose is the gift of tongues. Now, why did God use the gift of tongues? And then, of course, we could also ask, uh, why did God use the gift of interpretation of tongues? Because the gift of interpretation is based uh, on the existence of the gift of tongues. If the gift of tongues uh, does not endure throughout all the ages, then neither will the gift of the interpretation of tongues, because it's dependent. Well, we find as we do a study of scripture that the reason, the purpose for the gift of tongues was a sign of judgment upon the Jewish people. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 20 to 22, and of course this is uh, part of the passages or the chapters that have to deal with spiritual gifts. Paul says, Brethren, be not children in understanding, Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In other words, he's asking them to be mature in their understanding about the purpose of spiritual gifts. He says in the, uh, and in, in particular, the gift of tongues. He says in the law, and he's referring there to the Old Testament, it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people, and usually this people is referring to the Jewish people in disobedience to God, in rebellion against God. He calls them, otherwise he calls them my people, but sometimes when they're being disobedient and rebelling against God and seeking idols and that sort of thing, uh, he refers to them as this people. And it goes on, it says, And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Okay, so uh, firstly, we notice that tongues was not a sign for believers. Uh, whether it was, uh, some say that it's a sign to indicate whether someone's truly saved, or whether they've received the Holy Spirit, or whether they're truly spiritual, or some other reason. Uh, but the purpose of tongues, uh, according to the scripture, uh, was a sign to unbelievers. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So what kind of unbeliever is the gift of tongues for? Verse 21 tells us, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. The passage referred to in the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 28 verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Just like what happened at Babel where God came along and judged a disobedient people by giving them a, a variation of various different languages uh, of which they could not understand each other. So it is that God indicated that his judgment had come when the people heard foreign languages around them. Now there's several different references uh, to this principle uh, throughout the Old Testament in, in particular, uh, but it's also a principle in the New Testament. The Jewish people had rejected their promised Messiah despite the bright shining light that, that he had shown that he was the promised one. And as a result, God would uh, punish or judge the people of Israel by scattering them from their land. And this was the ultimate judgment of the Jewish people throughout their history. You could not um, do worse to the Jewish person than to take them away from their promised land. Uh, and so back in uh, Old Testament history, we find that uh, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, when they disobeyed uh, God, a generation after generation, eventually God allowed the Assyrians to come and to take them captured, captive, to carry them away. Uh, and then later with the land of Judah, they followed suit, uh, although there were certainly more godly kings uh, of the nation of Judah than there was of the nation of Israel to the north. Uh, and so uh, judgment was delayed because of that. But eventually uh, the Babylonians came 
uh, and they uh, took the people captive uh, for a period of 70 years. And then, of course, uh, in the New Testament, because they had rejected the, uh, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, throughout his ministry continued to heal and do miracles of various different kinds, and no one could point out any sin in his life, uh, and yet they rejected their promised Messiah despite all the prophecies of what he would be like uh, and what he would do. Uh, then uh, because of that, judgment would happen again. And this took place in 70 AD when the Roman general Titus uh, came with his troops and they sacked the city of Jerusalem. Uh, about 100,000 Jewish people were killed. And then uh, the Jewish people lost their land. They were taken captive and taken into other countries and uh, forbidden from, uh, from uh, being able to enter into Jerusalem for centuries after that. So to verify that the unbelievers spoken of here in this passage were actually Jewish rather than just generally unbelievers, uh, we find that 1 Corinthians 14, 23 and 24 goes on to say, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and we could, we could say there instead of prophesy, we could say preach, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And so we go, it goes on to talk about uh, if he hears the, the preaching of the word of God, he'll get convicted and uh, he'll, uh, he'll get saved. But if someone comes in and there's a bunch of people speaking in, in unlearned foreign languages, uh, they'll think, what, these guys are crazy. They're just, uh, they're just crazy. Um, so the gift of tongues was not to prove that Christians were mad. Uh, so obviously these unbelievers are different to the previous unbelievers that are mentioned, uh, which are obviously Jewish unbelievers. So history then seems to verify that the gift of tongues actually did cease shortly after the dispersal of the Jewish people from their native land. Early church historians seem mainly silent about the manifestation of tongues in their day. Uh, and of course, uh, by being silent, they're, they're basically uh, saying that uh, this was not something that necessarily took place. Uh, it seemed to be that it certainly wasn't a normal part of the Christian life in, in uh, that stage of church history. However, some church leaders said the following about the practice of unlearned tongue speaking. Very famous uh, Christian, early Christian, was a man by the name of Chrysostom. He was a famous uh, exegete, uh, one who studied the scriptures and uh, sought to understand what the scriptures were saying. He was also a very famous uh, preacher of early times. And he wrote when dealing with the spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14, that the whole passage seemed very obscure. That is the, the passage about the spiritual gifts uh, from 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. But he adds the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to and by their cessation. If you're not sure what that word cessation means, it means they had ceased, they had stopped. Uh, being such then used to occur, but now no longer take place. Now, Chrysostom was in the mainstream of Christianity at that time uh, in the early church and uh, and yet he's saying that the idea of tongues and miracles and those those unusual gifts uh, that they have they have stopped they used to occur but now they no longer take place that's in the early church another well-known early church Christian was Augustine uh, Augustine of Hippo is another uh, title that he has. Uh, and writing on 1 John, he said the earliest time the Holy Ghost fell upon them that believed and they spoke with tongues which they had not learned as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
These were signs adapted to the times for their behoof to be that betokening of the Holy Spirit in all tongues to show that the gospel of God was to run through all tongues over the, the whole earth. That thing was done for a betokening and it passed away. It passed away. So that was the consensus uh, of the early church uh, leaders that uh, speaking in tongues had ceased. It had passed away early in church history. So in conclusion, there are a variety of gifts available to us today. And God wants us to discern what gift or even what gifts we have and to use them for the glory of God. But we also have to acknowledge that not all the gifts listed in the New Testament are now available as they once were. For the purpose of our study, we will examine Romans chapter 12 and look at what have been called the motivational gifts. Uh, because each born again believer has one of these gifts. And so hopefully in the weeks to come, you will be able to discern what your spiritual gift is so that uh, you can develop that gift and use it for the glory of God. Let's close in prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, for your design, for the spiritual gifts that you have given. We thank you for the, the early gifts that uh, were given, the re revelatory gifts, the gifts uh, that indicated uh, uh, God's warning to the people of Israel. They needed to come to the Lord Jesus or face uh, the judgment of losing their land. And uh, Lord, we know that a number of those gifts now have passed. They've ceased. And uh, Lord, yet uh, you've not taken away all the spiritual gifts. And uh, we're excited to, uh, to be able to do this study and to be able to see what uh, various different gifts there are uh, that are available to us and uh, to find out which one uh, you have given to each of us. So we pray, Lord, give us discernment, help us uh, to understand and to be able to uh, recognize the gift that you've given us so that we can use it for your glory and honor. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.